Walnut Street. A conglomeration of white duck pants. Linen caps. Suspenders. And fancy sports sweaters. Long flowing dresses of white and pastel shades. Silk clad legs. Patient medicine men. Curbstone preachers. Gigolos, skin men. And ladies of the evening. The odor of hot dogs. Fish. Hot chili and barbecue. Beauty parlor. Lucky Morris. Taxi stands. And coals for sale. Overalls. Run over shoes. Broken half pint bottles. And depression. Walnut Street. Trolley cars crawling along at a snail's pace, trying to force their way through a strangely assorted mass of vehicles. Walnut Street, a continuous, monotonous murmur that presents the night life symphony. A composition of a certain plane of life that begins with a common time of curiosity and graduates into the fast tempo of reckless abandon, a sensualist rhythm arranged around the melody of pleasure. Off chords of despair and regret. Walnut Street. Walnut, Madison, Chestnut, Magazine. Long rows of trees extending the length of the streets on both sides. Like two long rows of sturdy sentinels on guard. Seem to stretch their broad limbs protectingly over the long lines of beautiful homes. And in the fall, borrow the mixed tints of the glorious sunset. Held them suspended from wavering branches until the fierce, blustering winter wind swept them away. Just like every other pretty avenue in every other city, West Walnut, Madison, Chestnut, and Madison Streets has its porches. Its shrubbery and its flowers, its youths and maidens with ukuleles. It has its popular girls, its good-looking boys, its ambitious youths, and its dreamers. The West End, Twilight. Roses, radios, ruffles, color, collisions, cars, clothes, maidens, and collectors, and music, and mortgages. Children playing hop, skip, jump, marking up the sidewalks with chalk. Old grandmothers who used to take great pride in their pretty dolls. Now sitting on the porches watching their granddaughters play baseball. The West End at Twilight. In due time, I were presented to Miss Smith. Later, as she and I were strolling about the grounds, I said, 
You know, Catherine, uh, I mean, Miss Smith, I've just been dying to meet you. Really? Hmm. Is that the human thing to say after me sending you a valentine? Oh, did I make them angry? <laughs> Don't do that. Oh. Uh, I forgot I were talking. I was thinking you were Alex. <laughs> and now look here. Catherine Smith, a lady of your standing does not go around pulling noses, do you? Well, now, Bert, I am not a habitual nose puller. I just like to pull on Alex's nose. Goodness knows, his nose knows, you know. <laughs> I know better. But, um, you see, it all started this way. We were playing one day, just chasing each other, wrestling, and so on. Alex was about to get away from me. And when I would grab after him, oh, he's so little. Well, his nose was the only thing I could get a toehold on. I understand perfectly. I nodded, but I didn't. How could anyone get a toehold on a nose? But all this was getting me nowhere. I had to get the conversation into more serious channels. I understand you are from abroad. Yes, I've only been over here for several years. I were born and raised across the water. Sometimes I yearn for the sight of my native land. Those happy hours I spent there, the drives down the romantic bud road, the times we climbed to the summit of the picturesque Silver Hills, the thrill of speeding along a hundred minutes a mile on the Main Street trolley, the old historical church on Main Street, second only to Notre Dame in ecclesiastical destination. Notre Dame had its hunchback while this church had its clock the only colored church in the world with a clock. I beg your pardon. Uh, my church, uh, that is, I went to a church where they had a clock. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I certainly did. I saw it with my own eyes up on the wall. Oh, but this clock I have reference to is up in the steeple. So there. I see. Well, tell me more, more about your native land. Oh. There was the community Christmas tree on Market Street. Catherine told me as she nervously picked the buttons off my coat and cut paper dolls out of the front of my shirt. Oh, imagine I see it now. The old rolling mill, rolling. The dogs, dogging. The horses, horsing. The rats, ratting. And, oh, to think. I left it all. I know how you feel, Catherine. I s still, you could not have brought all that with you. Telling me. <laughs> but Bert, it nearly broke my pocketbook. I mean, uh, my heart. Don't, <laughs> don't. You will have me crying too. I too used to live in New Albany. Then unable to restrain the tears any longer, I began to weep on her shoulder. We had a good old fashioned cry. <laughs> Did you break down too when you left your home? No, I, uh, I broke out. You see, Catherine, I used to be a good boy. I never carried matches or said, darn it, or went up dark alleys. Yes, yes, go on. Then, I met up with Bad Company, Coleman, wow. Raymond, Chester, Probit, and look, look at me now, just a gigolo. Uh, pardon me, am I intruding? Ah, oh, Miss Rose. Uh, Catherine, I mean, Miss Smith and I were swapping experiences. You know, Miss Smith was born across the water. You should hear her paint word pictures of her picturesque native country. It is a privilege to listen to Miss Smith. I would certainly like to hear about your native land, Miss Smith. Miss Rhodes said, dropping down on one of the marble benches. Uh, let us save our energy for the dance tonight. Miss Smith and I followed her suggestion. I sat between these two calmly ladies and we conversed on general topics. We talked about half hour when I said to Miss Rhodes, By the way, won't you give me a little story for my paper? Uh, I'm sorry, Bert, but I never give interviews. 
But you owe it to your public, Lottie. You don't want to be classed with Greta Garbo. Are you implying that I have large feet? Why no, Lottie. You misconstrue my meaning. I were alluding to Greta Garbo's aloofness, her cheap pretense at seclusion. A smile indicated the storm was over. About your trip to Chicago. Um, how do you like Chicago? Oh, it wasn't so hot. Meaning what? Exactly what I said. It wasn't so hot. Were you ever in Chicago in the winter time? <laughs> I see. Uh, tell me, Lottie, what were your impressions of the Grand Terrace Cafe? <laughs> your paper and the public were very much misinformed. I never visited the Grand Terrace. Never visited the Grand Terrace? Why? I can't imagine anyone visiting Chicago without going there. Well, it is not surprising you don't understand. Lottie's face colored with angry. I hasten to amend by saying, I mean, I don't see how you ignored their special invitation. Uh, don't be angry. Again, her smile returned. What I meant, Bert, was if you cherished memories of the snow-capped mountains of St. Moritz, the mecca of winter sports, skiing, sledding, and skating, the whole countryside covered in a blanket of snow, creating a million diamonds sparkling in the sunshine. If you had watched the fog race from the River Thames, listened to the Westminster chimes, heard the dong-dong of Big Ben, the age-old ceremonies of the King's Guards changing watch, Downing Street of London's diplomatic activities and Conan Doyle stories, Bert, if you were ever thrilled by a Venetian sunset or explored the ruins of ancient Rome, drifted in a gondola along an enchanting moon that made spangles of light on the waters of Venice, a native serenader playing seducing music upon a guitar, if you had ever the singular experience of being delightfully refreshed with sparkling Bordeaux and Burgundy and dreadfully frightened by the covetous stares of some lustful apache while slumming in the Montmartre and along the left bank of the Seine, the noted atelier where good fellowship is always to be found, or mingling with the art students in the Latin colony. Don't say any more, Lottie. Please, I understand. <sighs> Miss Smith, uh, did you? Miss Smith had vanished. When did she leave? Uh, I don't know. I guess while we were crossing the ocean. Oh, come.